Good evening, everyone. Be'ezrat Hashem, tonight we will be learning Sefer Mesilat Yesharim, Perak Yutet. We are dedicating tonight's learning for the well-being and safety of all those who are fleeing Ukraine. Uh, may all of them, Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, be protected and may they be safe on their way out wherever they go. We're also learning for their Fuashtma of Shachar ben Chana, Mordechai ben Evelin, Mordechai ben Sarah, Mordechai ben... Adina, Yaakov, Yisrael, Avraham, and Chana, Esther, Helen, may they all have a refuah shema b'toch, sh'ar chulei Yisrael, amen. So tonight the Mesirat Yishayim is going to start off with one more aspect of being a chassid. And that is the idea that a person needs to also, if he really truly loves Hashem, he needs to also be able to fight for Hashem. He needs to be somebody who stands up against those people that wage war against Hashem. Because if you really love somebody, part of how you are able to tell that you love that person is how much you're willing to fight for that person. If God forbid something happens to a person's spouse or a person's child, they will wage war. They will, it doesn't matter who's standing in their way, nothing matters. It's, it's the person's wife or husband or spouse, it, whatever has to happen. In order to make sure that they are okay, that's what needs to happen. And they don't make calculations of, oh, well, what will he think? What will she think? What will they say? It's just, I got to do this because I love that person. And I have to stand up to whomever is in my way. Because my love for that person is so, uh, so powerful that I, I just can't let anything happen to that person. And that's exactly what the idea the Mesilat Hashem is going to talk about right now. That's what this is all about. The idea is that He'anaf HaShlishi says the Mesilat Yesharim Hu HaKin'ah. We're talking about jealousy. What does it mean jealousy? It doesn't mean jealousy. It means rather being a zealot. She'yye ha'adam mekane l'shem kodsho. That a person has to be mekane, which means he has to be, he has to be a zealot l'shem kodsho. Right, which means sonet misanav umishtadel lehachniam. Somebody that that hates Hakadosh Baruch Hu, he hates him. Umishtadel lehachniam. He he makes every effort to subdue them. Bemashi yuchal in any way that he can. Meaning, there's a pasuk in Teilim. The pasuk says, "Halo misan echa Hashem esna." Those that hate you, Hashem, I hate them. The idea being that. My love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu is so strong that when somebody goes against Hashem, it's like I take it personally. I say, what does that mean? This person is going against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How could that be? How could a person go against Hashem who's so good to us, who loves us, who's taken care of us for thousands of years, who's been there for us? We owe him so much. And this guy has the audacity to say that you don't have to keep the Torah or that you don't have to do this and that. It's outrageous, and you take it, you take offense by it, take it personally. So this is the feeling that that we that a person who's a zealot, in other words, it's not just a guy that's happy-go-lucky. He's a person that you know. Yes, I love Torah. I do what I have to do. I do my mitzvot. I'm, you know, I don't do anything wrong. That's great. But now we're talking about the chasid, the next level of observance, which is where the person not only is somebody that observes the Torah and the mitzvot, but he also has the feeling, he has the passion that when somebody goes against Hashem, God forbid, and he says not nice things, and he, and he God forbid, desecrates Hashem's name and does things that are uh, wild and outrageous against Torah, that it, it bothers him. It, it, it's a part of him inside is, is saying this is very wrong and he wants to fight it. He wants to stand up against it against the Chilul Hashem, against the desecration of Hashem's name. So how does this manifest itself? So it's important to understand that the rabbis taught us in many different places that what this means is that a person needs to sometimes protest against others when he is able to, that he has the ability to stand up and say something, to make a change, to to say that you know there are certain types of behavior that are uh, that are being done and people should not be doing them, and he fails to do that, he fails to address the issue. So in this case, the 
the actually Chazal and the Mesdad Hashem is quoting that Chazal teach us over here in this type of a case that it, it falls on his head. It says that it's as if he is the one who's transgressing. Again, he might be a wonderful, fantastic Jew, but because of his failure to stand up to those who are doing that which is wrong, when he has the power to do so, he has the wherewithal to do so, then it goes on his head. We just read recently about Shaul HaMelech. Shaul HaMelech was the king of the Jewish people. And he was commanded to go and to wipe out Amalek. And it says that as he was commanded to do so, he was told, you have to kill every person, man, woman, child. You cannot leave behind any sheep, any cattle, nothing. You got to kill everything. Now, Shaul goes ahead and he, he kills almost everybody. He leaves King Agag and he also leaves the sheep and the cattle. Right? So over here comes along Shmuel and tells him, listen, you made a huge mistake. You, you did not listen to the words of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, so Shaul says, but the, the people, the people that were with me, they wanted these animals, the, the choicest, fattest animals as sacrifices to Hashem. They didn't want to kill them. They wanted to, to keep them alive, to bring them as an offering. So, so Shmuel responded to Shaul and told him, listen, we just read this Haftarah, right? If you find yourself to be small in your own eyes, in other words, you're very humble, which is true. Shaul was very humble. He says, but that has no place over here. He says, you are Rosh Shivte Israel. You are the head of the Jewish people, the head of all the tribes of Israel, which means that God gave you power to stand up for what is right. You are the king. You are the authority. You are the one that's supposed to tell the people that even if they have good intentions, but if it's not what Hashem wants, then it's wrong. It's evil. And they have to stop it immediately. And you fail to use the power that God gave you. And because of that, Hashem is taking it away from you. Because you don't use it properly. Here you are. You're charged with a certain duty, a certain obligation. And you fail. You fail to use it properly. So therefore, Hashem is removing it from you. So this is the message that Mesilat Yisraelim is telling us. Whenever a person is obligated, is, is given a certain power, is given a certain uh, ability, that he's able to do something and he fails to do something about it, so then that is considered to be on his head. Famously, the Gemara and Masechet Shabbat tells us that there was a cow that was, that, uh, was called Parato Shel Rabbi Eliezer, which means it was the cow that was, that was owned by Rabbi Eliezer. And it says that it used to go out with some kind of a decoration uh, in between its horns on Shabbat. Now the halakha says that you can't do that. You can't have a cow uh, carrying for you on Shabbat. And when it's something which is not, uh, something which is not uh, a part of uh, the, the simple needs of the animal, so then that's considered carrying on Shabbat. And therefore... Uh, they said that Rabbi Eliezer's animal was carrying on Shabbat uh, in the public domain, and that was something which was very bad. So the Gemara says, what do you mean the cow of Rabbi Eliezer? Rabbi Eliezer had, had hundreds of thousands of cows. He was a very wealthy man. What do you mean the cow? Right? So the Gemara answers, no, you're making a big mistake. It wasn't the cow. Rabbi Eliezer had many cows. We're talking over here about the cow which belonged to his neighbor. He had a lady that was a neighbor, and this woman had her cow go out with a strap in between its horns on Shabbat. And Rabbi Eliezer, who was the neighbor, had the ability to protest, and he had the ability to tell her to stop that because it was wrong of her to do that on Shabbat. And he didn't do so. So therefore, he is the one that is considered to be responsible for the actions of his, lady, of his neighbor because of the fact that that he was someone who had the ability to protest and didn't. And therefore, it's considered to be on his head. And it's something that we all need to, need to you know, be aware of. You know, sometimes a person comes home and he overhears uh, his wife or she overhears her husband uh, you know, on the phone speaking Lashon Ara and talking away, yapping away about gossiping about this person and that family member and all these different things. 
And it's very wrong, not allowed to do that. So there's something that needs to happen. The, the spouse who is a loving, caring person needs to protest and say, hey, you know, you can't talk about so-and-so like that. That's the Shonara. You know, somebody has to stand up and say something. It's an evil act which is taking place. Again, it might be somebody that you love, but at the same time, somebody needs to express if they have the power uh, to do something. And in other words, the person on the receiving end will listen and will be receptive to what this person is saying. You must say something. You have to say something. You can't just let it go. Again, not just because you are the police officer, but because you have a certain pain from the fact that, that the word of Hashem is being violated. It's for, it's, you're doing it for Hashem, not for yourself. That's a very important distinction. A lot of times people find themselves going around and uh, you know, speaking Lashon Ara or maybe even uh, shaming people publicly. You, know, you have a person that is speaking in the middle of the davening in shul. That's something which is extremely wrong. It's very bad. You cannot do that. But you also can't embarrass him publicly. You can't you know, go to the person publicly and shame him, right? But you can pick up the phone after, you know, during the weekday and say, hey, you know, I noticed that you tend to speak a lot during the prayer. That's very wrong. You know, you shouldn't do that. That would be an acceptable way to do that. You're not shaming him publicly. You're simply fulfilling the commandment of the Torah, which is to, uh, to protest when you see something that should not be happening. It has to be done the right way. And that's a very important thing. You have to know that you're doing it L'Shem Shamayim. Now, when it is done indeed L'Shem Shamayim, the pasuk in, in Sefer Bamidbar, when it talks about Pinchas, who got up and did the ultimate act of zealotry, that he went ahead and he literally killed two people uh, who were committing a forbidden act. You had the Nasi of Shevet Shimon, and you had uh, Kozbi Batsur, that they were literally uh, together. And, uh, and as, as they were in the middle of the act, Pinchas got up and killed them because this man was doing something which is punishable by death. As it says in, in the Gemara, Habba al Ha'aramit, somebody who has relations with a non-Jewish woman publicly in front of 10 men, kanaim pogimbo. The zealots have the right to uh, inflict harm on this person. So Pinchas literally stabbed them together in the point at which they were uh, together as one in their bodies. And he lifted them up and held them together so that everyone should see. It was a very, very uh, 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 powerful scene to see. But it says over there that as a result of his vengeance that he took on behalf of Hashem since he took vengeance for Hashem he, he atoned for what the Jewish people were doing right so because of what he did he stopped a tremendous plague from, from wiping out Am Yisrael so he did something very powerful again I'm not telling you that it's an easy decision to make but Sometimes such decisions need to be made. Now, it's important that a person consult with a rav uh, in any type of a matter like this. You can't just make these decisions on your own. You have to know what is considered to be acceptable, what is considered to be not acceptable, what is okay, when is it okay to, uh, to do something, uh, and when is it not okay to do something. Pinchas, before he did what he did, the Gemara tells us, had a conversation with Moshe. And he said, Moshe Rabbeinu, didn't you teach us that in this in this situation, this is the halacha? And Moshe Rabbeinu said, yes, that is true. And he said that the one who delivers the message, he should be the one to carry out uh, what it says there. So being that Pinchas was the one who, so to say, uh, brought this halacha to light uh, in light of his discussion with Moshe Rabbeinu, he should be the one to go ahead and do it. And that's when he did it. So in other words, there has to be a certain feeling that the person has inside. And then that person, uh, when he has that feeling of zealotry for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he has to make sure that it's being channeled properly. He has to make sure that it's being done the right way. And that is something which is very, very important to, to know that that is part of 
one's avodat Hashem. Part of your avodat Hashem is to know that what you are doing is proper and is correct. So a person might feel like this is the right thing to do, but you got to consult. You have to make sure that you ask uh, first whether or not this which you desire to do, again, for the right reasons, for the Shem Shamayim, is indeed correct or not. But the point is that the feeling, nevertheless, should be there. There should be a feeling of hurt or pain. When a person sees something as severe as this, you should feel deep down inside that, wow, these people are going against Hashem. It hurts. It's not a pleasant thing. Okay. So, says the says the Mesilat Yesharim, Vezet Pashut, very simple, he says, Ki mi sheohevet chavero, if you love your friend, i efshar lo lisbol, sheyireh makim et chavero, it's impossible that you will, that you will just stand by and suffer and watch your friend get beat up, o mecharfim uto, or watch your friend get made fun of, cursed at, there's no question that you're going to go and help your friend because he's your friend. He says the same thing when it comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Somebody who loves Hashem. He can't, he can't bear the idea that somebody is going to go desecrate Hashem's name and will go and, and violate the mitzvot of Hashem. And that is what it says in Mishlei, Ozvei Torah Yehalelu Rasha, those who leave the Torah praise the wicked person. Veshomrei Torah Yitgaru those who keep the Torah will, will, will try and fight off these types of people. So again, the understanding is very clear. If you view your relationship with a friend the same way, your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, rather, the same way you view your relationship with a friend, then you'll understand exactly what's going on. You know, it's, there's no question, this is always the attitude of the Gedolei Yisrael. The Gedolei Yisrael understood that the observance of Torah is always for our benefit. It's all, because when you're following the wisdom of Hashem, that's like the guide, that's the handbook for life. Right? That's the handbook. It's the manual that Hashem gave us. Just like when you buy a car, there's a manual. Just like when you buy a computer, there's a handbook. It teaches you how to use it. So the same thing over here. There is a, there's a manual to life. It's called the Torah. And it's there in order for us to understand how to live life. It's there to understand what life is all about. And this is imperative in order for us to have a good life. So first of all, the Gdolim always look at the observance of Torah, which is to for one's benefit, as something which if someone doesn't do, he's losing out. He's not going to have a happier life. He's, he's going to run after all kinds of nonsense. And then eventually down the road, after so many different life experiences, he is going to find himself feeling empty and not happy. And the rabbi has wanted to prevent this from him. So many people that you hear, so many times. How many people have won the lottery, won, taken millions and millions of dollars into their lives and spent it all and left, left with nothing? How many people have been married and had terrible marriages and had so many you know, disasters? Again, there's so many issues that come up. The Chachamim always look at, at the observance of Torah and mitzvot as the, this is your guide to life. This is what's going to be good for you. So the first feeling that we have, just as love to our fellow, right, that, that Chachmei Yisrael always feel the need to teach more Torah, to bring people closer to Torah, is for their own benefit, to give them better lives. Because when a person comes closer to Torah, his life is, is much better. The, the child that gives respect to his father, listens to his father and mother, there's kavod, there's respect, there's love in the home, there's harmony in the home. It's a happy home. It's, it's like, it's a beautiful life for this person. So the first feeling that just as between people that we have is the idea that the Chachamim want the good for us, want us to have a good life. 
And that's, that's a very important concept here. So that's why they're trying to bring a person closer to Torah for the first, that's the first reason. Let's say, for example, you're walking in the street. That's a lot of times you go in Israel, you're walking in the street, you see a Jewish girl, a wonderful Jewish girl, completely dressed in the most revealing and immodest way. It hurts. It hurts. Sniut is for the benefit of this girl. It's to make, it's to give her uh, a better life. It's to attract the right people into her life, not people that are empty and vain. It's, it's so important for a girl to have tzniut. So again, when, when this chacham looks at the situation, he's in pain because he knows that this girl is, is missing out on the most beautiful life of a life of tzniut, which would mean that she has all the good blessings there for her. So the first feeling that the Chachmei Yisrael have is that it's just so sad for her for, or for him. They don't have Shabbat. They don't have Kashrut. They're, you know, they're, it hurts to see this person lose out on something so good. But then there's, as far as Hashem is concerned, says the Mesilat Yesharim, when Hashem sees that a, fellow, that a fellow Jew is transgressing, Hashem suffers. Right now, right before Megillat Esther, where we are in the ultimate time of, of what Esther represents. The Gemara asks, how do we know about Esther in the Torah? Where, is, where does the Torah reference Esther? And it says, the Pasuk says, I will hide myself, Hashem says, on that day. We are living in this time where we don't see Hashem revealed. We don't see Hashem openly. We don't see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is running the world in a very clear way. Hashem hides himself. It's all hidden. It's, you have to dig a little bit beneath the surface to see it. It's very clear, but it's not outwardly clear. So Chazal teaches us, Sohar says, in many different places, the idea that when Hashem is hidden, which is during the exile, He's not revealing himself like he would in the time of the Beit HaMikdash where there would be open miracles all the time. But during this time when Hashem is in exile, Hashem, so to say, quote unquote, is suffering. Hashem is suffering because Hashem doesn't want to see that his children are doing all kinds of things against his will. And every time somebody else does something against the will of Hashem, Hashem is suffering even more and more. So the Mesilat Yashim is about to transition now and to tell us that the suffering of Hashem is concern number one of the, of the Hasidim. This is the very first thing that's on the Hasid's mind. So I'll read to you his words inside. He says, yes, of course, a person has to love his fellow and care for the well-being of his fellow and want him to do Torah mitzvot for his fellow. And a person has to try and rebuke if, if necessary if there's, if there's a listening ear on the other end and to do it properly in the right way, yes, that's all very true. And a person has to you know, try to come closer, very good. But there's a level of, of, of hurt that a chassid feels, and that's the level of hurt when it comes to the suffering of the shechina. That the idea that as long as the shechina is in exile and people are not following Torah Mitzvot, Hashem is suffering. And that pain is our pain. That's, that's what the Mishnah Hashem is trying to explain over here. So let's read it together. What does this Hasid want? What is really his main focus in life? He wants that Hashem's name should become greater and greater in the world. I'll read to you his words inside. It says, the ultimate thing for this chassid, for this pious Jew, is that man should work. His, his efforts should be in order to increase the honor of Hashem in this world, that it should grow and it should be increased. That's what this Hasid is looking for. And that's what he desires. That the world should become full of the knowledge of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and that his 
honor should be increased in the world. And if you think about it, this concept is so fundamental to, to Judaism that this is what we say every day in shul. Every day. And when somebody dies and they have to pray for his neshama to be elevated, this is exactly what we say. What am I referring to? The Kaddish. What is the Kaddish talking about? Kaddish says, Yit gadal, yit kadash It's a prayer. May Hashem's name, may Hashem's great name, grow and be sanctified in the world. That's what we're praying for. And you ask yourself, well, why is this something that you pray for when somebody dies? What is this? The, why is this the thing that we say at a funeral when somebody has just died or when somebody is in the year of mourning for a parent or for a sibling for 12, for 30 days? What is the significance of these words? Yit gadal, may it grow. Yit kadash, and may it be sanctified. Shmei Rabbad, his great name. What's the big deal about it? Why is that the, the prayer for the dead people? The answer is because when a person prays that Hashem's name should grow in the world, then what that means is that he desires deep down inside that Hashem's name should grow and be great in the world. And that's why he's praying for it. When Hashem sees that the fellow who died or the lady who passed away has left behind her someone like this, that this is what he prays for. He's praying that Hashem's honor should be increased and grown in the world. It should be that Hashem's, the knowledge of HaKadosh Baruch Hu should fill up the entire world. And Hashem says, this was a good person. This was somebody who's worthy of Gan Eden. And the person has an elevation for his soul because of the fact that they left behind somebody who understands that this is what, what we should all be desiring, what we should all be praying for. What do we pray for on Rosh Hashanah? The holiest day of the year, Shana Yom Kippur. What are the two? What are the things that we ask for? We ask that all the terrible uh, powers of the world that prevent us from seeing Hashem should be gone. Kita avir memshelet zadol minaharetz. Get rid of the of the negative forces that prevent us from being together. That prevent us from from seeing the clear divine presence in the world. That is the ultimate level. Now let's read what, what he brings down from Eliyahu Hanavi. Tana de Eliyahu says the Nestad Sharim, Zahur Atov, Amru, Kol Chacham Mi Yisrael, Shiesh Bo Devar Torah Lamito. Any Chacham in Am Yisrael, any wise man, any sage that has true knowledge of Torah, Umit Aneach Al Kvodo Shel Hakadosh Baruch and he is just just groaning, so sad over the honor of Hashem, shel Israel, and over the honor of Am Yisrael, Kol Yamav, he's always sad about it, all his days. Umit ave umetzer lichvod Yerushalayim lichvod et Hamikdash v'la Yeshua. He is he is like suffering in the honor of Yerushalayim and Bet Hamikdash. He's he's awaiting. The Yeshua, the salvation of Mashiach, Shetitzmach, that it should come quickly, Bekarov, Ule Kinus Galioti is awaiting the, the, the diaspora, all the Jews all over the world to come in together to Eretz Israel. This person who really feels it, he really desires it, he was really waiting for it. This person, Zoche Leruach HaKodesh Bidvarab, will merit to have the divine spirit in his words. So says the Nesilat Yishorim, Nimtzet alamed shezot ya kavana ha-meula shehi rechoka legamu mikol hanat atzmo. Over here, the person is not thinking about himself. He's not thinking about, oh, I'm serving Hashem because I'm going to get reward in the world to come. Oh, I'm serving Hashem for the benefit of that person. No, I'm serving Hashem because I want the greatness of Hashem to be known in the world. I'm totally thinking about Hashem, not me. This is a very high level. It's a, it's a different level than what we're used to. So that's exactly what I was saying before. This is what Kaddish is all about. This is what we're praying for. That's what we're praying for on Rosh Yom Kippur. So this is the idea that the person is constantly having 
צער, he's suffering, על הגלות, because of the exile, ועל החורבן, and because of the destruction. So this is what's going on over here. This is why the Chachamim always wanted Mashiach to come. What's the great thing about Mashiach coming? Thank God, a person who's living a, in a good life, he has, he's able to learn, he's able to work, he's able to make a living and have a family, and everything is good. So what does he need Mashiach for? The answer is because the world right now, and for the last 2,000 years, which has been in a state of exile, where Hashem's presence has been hidden, you can't see it so clearly. We're praying for that to change. And even a person who has everything and has it all so good, but he doesn't have the world in a state of knowledge of Hashem. That is the big difference. That's the difference between when Mashiach comes and before him. And that's what we're praying for. And we're praying for that not because of the fact that we're waiting for some kind of a reward. We're praying for that because of the fact that, that we know that this is the ultimate purpose of why the world was created. For the world to reach that day when everybody will see Hashem clearly when everybody will understand that our mission in life was to come closer to HaKadosh Baruch not to do things that will take us away from Hashem. That's the idea. And that's why they desired the Geulah so much. Now, asks the Nesilat Yisharim, a person may ask the following question. You know, how many great people, great sages, have come before us. How many great Chachamim? You have the Ariya Kadosh, you had a Rishimon Bar Yochai, you had uh, the, uh, you know, Marana Bet Yosef. You had so many great righteous people that came before that they were all praying and they were all suffering and they felt it by far more than me and you. So the question is, if that's the case, what then is it worth for me to get up and pray for Mashiach to come? Why is it at all even, I mean, they weren't able to bring Mashiach. I'm able to bring Mashiach, right? Think of it that way, right? So to that comes along the Mesla Deshaim and answers that no, it doesn't work that way. Because Adam Arishon was built, was created alone in the world. And he says, it's in order to teach us a lesson that that every person should say, Bishvili Mivrah HaOlam. The whole world was created for me, which means in the same way that Adam Rishon was created alone in the world and there was a challenge for him, so too you are created alone in this world. There's a challenge for you. Of course, there are other people around you, but the point is, as far as you're concerned, you have to deal with you and yourself accomplishing your mission. Your mission is to focus on bringing the divine presence into the world, increasing knowledge of Hashem in the world. That's our job as Jews, making this world a place that everybody sees Hashem more clearly. So you're praying for that. You're praying for Mashiach because that's your job. And Hashem is expecting you to do that. And Hashem is waiting for you for yourself. That's your personal job. He says, Hine. He says, look, those generations before us, they did theirs. They got up and they prayed for Mashiach. They got up and they prayed for the suffering of the divine presence in the exile to stop. They did what they had to do. So now it's our job to do what we have to do. It says in Pirkei Avot that Lo Alecha Ligmor, not is upon you the obligation to see that the job is done. But on the other hand, you're not allowed to be exempt from it. You're not exempt from it. You have a job. The job must get done. Whether it's going to be completed or not is not up to you. That's a separate issue. Whether through your prayers, Mashiach will come or not, whether through the extra tzedakah that you give, Mashiach will come or not, and the world will have an increased knowledge of Hashem and clarity of Hashem, that Hashem runs the world, that's not relevant. It's completely unrelated to the fact that regardless, you have a job to do and you have to do your job. And that's what he's saying over here. And when we do that job, we do that out of the desire and the will to simply increase the knowledge of Hashem in the world. 
We want it to be very clear to all of us, to all of our fellow brothers and sisters in Am Yisrael, and to all the Goyim as well, that Kadosh Baruch Hu is totally in charge of every little detail that goes on in this world. That's our job. That's why we read the Megillah on Purim. What's the whole purpose of this Megillah? The whole purpose is that even though they were in a similar situation to what we're in, where you can't see Hashem openly and visibly, it's not so clear. But when you see what took place, when you see that years before Haman even made a decree on Am Yisrael with King Achashverosh, Mordechai already, already had saved King Achashverosh from an, an assassination attempt, and that it was written in the book of Chronicles, and it hadn't been written, and it hadn't been opened up and read until the very time that Esther Amalka just uh, was about to try and save Am Yisrael. And Mordechai was there written in a very good, uh, in a very good uh, uh, way. And he hadn't been repaid until that very moment. When you see that all the pieces of the puzzle come together, there's only one logical conclusion that you can make. And that is that all of this was divinely orchestrated. All of this was from Hashem. That's the conclusion. That's why you read the Megillah. The Gemara asks, why don't we say Hallel on Purim? The Gemara says, because reading the Megillah itself is the Hallel. That's the praise of Hashem. Because when you see what took place over here, it's true. In, in not one spot in the entire Megillah does it say the Shem Hashem Yud Kei Vav Kei. But at the same time, when you see all of the different details come together, you have no other recourse but to say that this is all from Hashem. That's the whole purpose of the Megillah. And that's what we want the world to see today. That everything that we see going on around us is all HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We want to increase the knowledge of Hashem. That's why we pray for Mashiach. That should be, That's what we're praying for. And that's what it says in the Pasuk. says the Mesilat Yishayim, Tzion hi Doresh Enla. The Navi is screaming that that the land of Israel is desolate. Tzioni, it is, it is Tzion, it is Zion, it's Yerushalayim. Doresh Enla, nobody cares about it. Nobody's interested. Nobody wants to know from, from Israel. The Navi is screaming about it. Everybody was happy wherever they were in Europe and the other countries. Nobody's, nobody's hurt. Nobody's crying over the fact that they didn't have Yerushalayim or Kodesh anymore. And that's a travesty. When we're comfortable where we are, when we're happy with the status quo, and we're totally oblivious to the fact that the Shekhinah is crying, suffering because of what's going on in the world, and we ignore it completely, that, says the Navi, is something that is very, very wrong. And our job is to tap into that and to feel the pain of the Shekhinah and to say, no, Hashem, we, we're not happy with the way things are right now. What does it mean the way things are? We might be fantastically observant people. We might have everything good, but we're not happy with the fact that Hashem, you're hiding, you're hidden. We don't see you in a revealed way. We don't have that ability to connect with you like it used to be in years past because you're so hidden. When we don't accept that, when we, when we, don't, uh, we don't feel that, that says the Mesilat HaShem is a very big problem. And that's, that's what we should be looking for. And again, nothing to do with reward, nothing to do with other people's benefit, everything to do with simply our love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Again, when we learn these subjects, I'm not trying to say that I am, uh, you know, somebody who uh, has mastered these things at all, uh, but I'm trying to learn this together with you in order that we should know what should our goals be. What should we really be feeling? Where should we, where should we be? I've seen some of the greatest chachamim of our generation. When they talk about the Bet HaMikdash, they start to cry. They really, literally start to cry. On Tisha B'Av, some of the greatest rabbis sit down on the floor and they literally shed tears over Bet HaMikdash. You say, what do you mean? 2,000 years ago, there was a building. It was destroyed. What you, what's the big problem? You have temples here. Everywhere you go, there are shuls. You got whatever you want. What's the problem? 
yeah, but we don't have the Beth HaMikdash. We don't have Hashem revealed in the world like it used to be. It was a totally different world. And it's gone ever since we lost Beth HaMikdash. So that pain, that pain that not that I'm feeling, that Hashem is feeling for not being able to be revealed in the world because of what we're doing wrong, because we're not doing enough to make a, a home for him spiritually. That pain is what we're feeling as well. And we, we have to try and tap into that. Okay, everybody. So that, we're almost done with chapter 19. We will continue with it. and finish it uh, next week. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Chazakim Bruchim Batzlachah.